director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. We're a global campaign coalition uh, across all the world, of, consisting of over, I think, 600 organizations uh, working to um, get all governments to join the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, to ban and eliminate all nuclear weapons. We were really founded uh, in order to kind of help unify activists and organizations into a, a big push for nuclear disarmament uh, to kind of um, work as a cross-cutting issue to, to enable people to get together uh, on one sort of limited aspect of, of the whole political spectrum of, of issues to, to make a difference, really. I think that a lot of people around the world uh, are very supportive but don't know where to start. So we were really founded to help people get involved uh, and help people uh, get rid of nuclear weapons. Before the end of the Cold War, how many nuclear weapons did we? Height of the Cold War, like in sort of in the early 80s, um, there were around 70,000 nuclear weapons uh, around the world. And I think now we're down to about 12,000. Um, but I think it's important to, to kind of note that, of course, there was a drastic reduction uh, at the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, huge process of nuclear disarmament. Um, but it's really stopped right now. So now we're quite flat at the moment. And the only reductions that are happening right now are um, decommissioned weapons that haven't been that have been in storage for a long time anyway the operational arsenals are not actually decreasing anymore in fact we've seen countries like China and the United Kingdom actually increase a bit uh, I also know the American um, expenditures on nuclear weapons went up a lot actually in the time of Obama I believe he um, allocated large amount of funding to I guess not increasing the amount, but in, uh, just I guess it's an old system now, right? And so they're improving mm. the state of the weapons. We've seen uh, huge investments in nuclear weapons lately, and this is what we've been warning about for the last decade, that we've seen a very worrying trend of massive modernization programs, maybe not just quantitative increases of the arsenals, but qualitatively increases as well. Uh, finding new missions, new types of nuclear weapons, improving um, missile systems, for example, the del delivery systems for the nuclear weapons. Um, and we've also seen a, a more threatful rhetoric and of course tension between nuclear armed states increasing. Uh, so we really have seen what many people call a new nuclear arms race. It's not in the same kind of quantities as in the 80s, but in practice, in reality, it's it's a nuclear arms race. What kind? So, just to give people an understanding of the, the what modernization means. So, modernization means also that the actual weapons themselves, the bombs themselves, are much larger. And then there's a the small tactical nuke concept, mm. which I think is very frightening. So both, both larger and smaller and different ones. I mean, they're trying to figure out different types of weapons, and uh, there's a, a big worry about these what they call the smaller nuclear weapons, of course, this idea that they are more usable. There's less of a threshold for using them. Um, and we've seen that, of course, now with uh, Russia's threats to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, we have been looking at sort of, um, could this be mean that Russia would be, uh, you know, able to use tactical nuclear weapons and that's a small nuclear weapon. But what we have to understand is that by today's standard, uh, what is seen as small is really Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons. Um, Russian tactical nuclear weapons are believed to be between 10 kilotons to 100 kiloton bomb. The Hiroshima bomb was 15 kilotons. That's one of the smaller of the small tactical nuclear weapons. And that bomb killed 140,000 people. So I think it's really important that we put the, those sort of um, that scale in context, when we talk about miniaturized or smaller nuclear weapons, it's not small bombs, right? Like it's massive bombs. It's huge. And they are built to wipe out civilian populations still. That, that's what a nuclear bomb is for. It's not a, it's not a weapon that's meant for position guidance, taking out a specific military unit or a specific military target. It's meant to wipe out cities. That's what they build to do.
That's terrifying. And I, um, and, and just to continue down this road of terror, wh what are the big bombs now doing? Like, what are, where are we maxing out and what are they capable of? I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure actually, what if we know exactly how big they are, it's a lot of unknowns and it's not a lot of uh, information um, that has been disclosed, but we know that, for example, the largest bomb that Russia tested or Soviet tested was this Tsar Bomba that was, um, I think it was megatons we were talking about here. Like, I think it's, it's, it's so, it was so massive that test that it's really, there's just no way to even imagine that being able to be used. I mean, it's just so absurd to think about these kind of weapons. So let's talk about um, this idea of disarmament. So how are you talking about it now, given that it's very obvious that when you do have nuclear weapons, you're safe? <laughs> so help me help us understand how we go from that sort of how do we back away from that standoff? Because if you have nuclear weapons, you won't be invaded. Right. And how do we get away from that? that dynamic here in, in the global system still kind of relies on the that the assumptions that the other side makes the same assumptions as you and it relies this deterrence theory is very fragile and very emotional and very deeply irrational if you think about it uh, this idea that you would be prepared to basically commit global suicide uh, there, it would never be justified to do it. It would never be rational to do that, which means that the other side must know that you wouldn't do that, which means that deterrence doesn't actually, the threat is it actually credible, unless it is credible, but then you're also prepared to use them and actually wipe out, which means that you're a target of nuclear weapons. Everyone who has nuclear weapons is a target of nuclear weapons. And I think that's something that we very often miss, this idea that they protect us, they wouldn't dare to, but of course they, they, the missiles are aimed at you. The, the, the Russians have missiles, they have their coordinates ready for Washington, from, for Seattle, for LA, for all the major cities of the United States. They're ready to launch them within very short time frames. Um, and they are probably not directed at countries that don't have nuclear weapons in the same way. So having nuclear weapons also makes us uh, very vulnerable. And also, of course, the risk of them being used is not zero. And there are absolutely, I mean, we have to look at the realities. Very often people, when people talk about nuclear weapons, they stop at these abstract theories and they have all these guesses about how others would react. And basically the United States is just hoping that Putin will do the right thing. That's your whole security strategy. And, and, and to me, that feels extremely insecure that he will always be rational. He will always take you know, good decision. He'll never make a mistake. Uh, I, I don't think that that's for granted. So we know that people are flawed. We know that people make mistakes. We know that people don't take rational decisions always. And we also know that um, accidents can happen. And if these weapons are used, the consequences are so catastrophic. And organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, the UN's humanitarian organizations, the World Medical Association, like groups of doctors, nurses, have all concluded that they have no ability to provide sort of effective help if nuclear weapons are being used. Even one bomb, there is no, there's no help possible um, from a sort of emergency responders. They would just leave everyone, even those that survived, they would just leave them to their own destiny because of the radioactive you know, fallout in the area. So we know that we can't handle the consequences of this weapon, yet we just blindly kind of continue to threaten to use them and continue to accept that the opponents are threatening us to use them and just wishful thinking that nothing will ever go wrong. And I think that we'll, we have to reckon with the fact that if the risk is not zero, so it's higher than zero, uh, we don't know exactly how high the risk is. It's very, it's impossible to calculate now, but it's, uh, we definitely know that it's over zero, which means that given enough time, it will be used. And we've already gone, what is it, 78 years, 77 years uh, with these weapons. Uh, and we've been very, very lucky. Uh, we've had very near misses, 
very close calls, massive accidents that were very close to be trigger nuclear weapons use or detonations. Um, and we won't be that lucky forever. Uh, a lot of researchers and scientists have said that uh, kids born today have a higher likelihood of seeing nuclear weapons being used than not. And if we just think about that for a second, that, that kids born today are more likely to see nuclear war than not. That is terrifying. I think about that all the time, which is why I keep this, I keep mm. talking about this and I keep this in everyone's frontal lobe cortex because I feel like this goes back into the background of everyone's mind. Mm. Let's talk about what you're doing with ICANN and how you are trying to get, what is your dream scenario? How, if, 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 if everyone listened to you, what would the world do? Like, how would how would everyone back off of their arsenals? We've seen massive progress happen before. I think we've talked our way into making this weapon so like almost like a magical weapon. It's just a giant bomb. And we have gotten rid of other weapons in the past. And we have decided to not do really inhumane things anymore because they were wrong and, and we're better than that. And we have actually, it doesn't feel like it sometimes when we look at the news, but we have made massive improvements in the world and we've made decisions that we are not going to do this anymore. Um, so I think it's definitely possible. I also think that like for now, for example, when we've seen uh, Putin invade Ukraine, um, not saying that nuclear weapons are protecting Russia, but basically saying, I'm gonna invade this country and if you try to stop me, I will use nuclear weapons. I think we also see how vulnerable we are that we are unable and like the countries like the United States can't help because they have nuclear weapons themselves, the United States. And if you help in Ukraine, then you maybe start nuclear war and nobody wants to start nuclear war. And Russia knows that nobody wants to start nuclear war. So I think that this is like, you know, this kind of endless, um, the consequences of this are so massive as well that I think that it's, it's really in everyone's interest and in particular in countries, uh, that don't accept that we should just mass murder civilians um, as a way of protecting ourselves. Um, it's in our interest to pursue nuclear disarmament. So my ideal scenario would of course be that people all over the world will demand that their governments sign the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The treaty bans nuclear weapons, the use, the possession, the testing. Um, and then it, it also sets up the, the, the process for eliminating these weapons. Uh, and of course, we know that the elimination of nuclear weapons will take a long time. It's, it's a lot of work to dismantle 12, 13,000 nuclear warheads. Um, but it's something that needs to start now. And in order to get there, to get our governments to actually join this treaty, um, we really have to uh, create a lot of political pressure. Uh, but we also have to stigmatize nuclear weapons. I think for too long, we've seen it as a symbol of power and not as a symbol of shame and disgust. Like in the way that we don't think that a country with chemical weapons, for example, is oh one of the most powerful and they are so um, important. Uh, we see it as awful, like no chemical weapons, terrible. Like no, no legitimate country would use that. No leader with any, you know, if you use that, you go to the ICC, you go to the Hague, you're a war criminal. But nuclear weapons have had another sort of symbolic power status. And we can change that. And we can change that without their permission. We can really make it more difficult. We, we can't force someone like Putin or even someone like a US president, right? To, to disarm if they don't want to, but we can raise the bar for what's acceptable. We can make it more difficult and more costly to have these weapons so that eventually it will be more valuable for them to disarm than to keep these weapons. And I think that's what we're trying to do with the treaty. We're just shifting the, the cost and the burden of having these weapons. The more we can kind of put the burden on having these weapons, the easier it's going to be for them to take the decision to disarm. You know, it's interesting living in America that has, you know, free flow of guns in the country. You know, one of the arguments that, that the gun lobby has is, you know, they go the other way. They said, look, everyone needs to be armed because that, that way everyone's safe. And that's sort of what's going on right now in the thinking of nation states. Mm -hmm. It's the strangest thing. And then if you think about it in the inverse, 
let's just say you had one pariah state that had the nukes. How do we contain that, that state? How do we deal with the ones that don't want to disarm? I mean, I think we can do a lot. Uh, and we've seen that before as well. And I honestly think that nuclear weapons are quite unusable. They're not great weapons to use in a military conflict because it just creates a mass catastrophe, a lot of radiation uh, and, and chaos. Uh, it's not even the way the military warfare is developing. I mean, the military wants precision guidance missiles. They want uh, lethal AI weapons. They want cyber weapons. They have a whole new way of fighting warfare in, in that way. Uh, this is very old fashioned. This is 1940s technology. Uh, just wipe out a whole city. Um, it, is, it is war crimes. And of course, you know, I don't think that disarmament will happen, that all countries will get rid of nuclear weapons and one will, will uh, keep them. I think it's really going to be a, a gradual process um, of also lowering the value of them. And the less we value them, the less they will sort of scare and intimidate people as well. Um, and I think that that's really the, the key to get to disarmament, that kind of seeing them for the useless, dangerous and reckless weapons they are, not actually something that is usable for any country. And where are you now? Where's everybody with the idea of nuclear winter? I rem so I'm 54 and I grew up in the 80s with that looming, you know, catastrophe of nuclear winter. And I remember there was a famous, you know, I had it in the movie, this meeting between the Russians and the Americans where they were talking about nuclear winter and understanding it. And, and then I was reading recently that people were saying, well, maybe nuclear winter won't happen. I don't know if you've been on top of that debate. Are we still understanding nuclear winter? And can you explain it to people so that we remember? Mm. This research from the from the 80s that showed that if the US and Soviet at the time would have a sort of full-scale nuclear war, uh, the fires and the suit from those um, explosions would be uh, going up in the atmosphere and create this cloud that would um, prevent sunlight from coming in and drastically cool the global climate. Um, I'm sure there's, just like with climate change, right? Like there's many different researchers and scientists and they might model things differently, but of course that was an effect and how exactly impactful that would be, I'm, I'm sure you can debate uh, and, and scientists, but I think it's pretty well recognized that it would have an impact. And actually in later years, now uh, a few years ago, there was new research showing that even with a, a so-called limited nuclear war, so not even the US and Soviet, but if you had, say, India and Pakistan using about 100 nuclear bombs each, a very small fraction of today's nuclear arsenals, you'd still get that kind of result. Um, not a complete nuclear winter for, for forever in that way, but you would have a drastic um, cooling of the climate with about four or five degrees uh, very, very quickly that would completely knock out global crops of corn, rice, um, and lead to mass starvation all over the world. It wouldn't be a new ice age or things like that, but it would have catastrophic impact on food supplies uh, and would lead to mass starvation in, of course, all over, the, all over the world. So no corner of the world would be unimpacted by the decisions made by two leaders in India and Pakistan, for example. So it's very much still the case that these consequences will be felt by the rest of the world. Maybe not one nuclear bomb, but as soon as you get to things like a uh, hundred nuclear bombs each, we are talking about uh, a global impact. Which is why the doomsday clock is how, is how many minutes before midnight? The, the doomsday clock, this, uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists measure how close we are to doomsday really. And it's now set at hundred, seconds before midnight. It's the closest it's ever been. And that was set before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I would say that it's closer even than, than, than that now. Um, I think we are as close as we've been to nuclear war since probably the Cuban Missile Crisis right now. The last thing I will ask is, so where do we go from here? I mean, I wouldn't do this job if I wasn't an eternal optimist. Uh, I think 
people are, a lot of people are discovering the nuclear threat for the first time in their lives right now. A lot of younger people who haven't thought about this issue, uh, thought it was an old Cold War thing that was over, um, are discovering that we still have these weapons and they can still happen and they can happen just by, you know, one person like Putin deciding. Uh, and I think a lot of people are recognizing how it, nuclear weapons makes us so vulnerable to people like Putin, Kim Jong-un, uh, Trump before that. Um, and it's really uncomfortable. I don't feel safe putting my entire, my country's future, my family's future in the hands of Putin and just say, I think he's gonna make the right decisions. So I think this is a massive moment where we can actually utilize this, this um, new awareness about nuclear weapons to push for progress. We have actually seen historically that the most progress we've had on nuclear disarmament has come after these crises. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis led to the Partial Test Ban Treaty. Um, in the 80s, uh, this kind of uh, the Able Archer exercise, for example, led to the INF Treaty. We have seen how these big moments have also led to big pro progress. So I think this is the moment where people should get active. Uh, this is the moment where we should really tell our politicians that we have to stop being so naive and thinking that we can just keep these weapons forever and nothing bad will happen. Um, we have to start making a plan really for how to join the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, how to get rid of these weapons, how to completely shift this. Thank <music> you.